this series of volumes, now volume three, has 50 essays by Jungian analysts that each show a different facet of the Red Book. And it's really an impressive collection. And I urge you to take a look at this book, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. Uh, volume three, I'm now told that there may be a volume four and a volume five. Introduction by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. It has again been an astonishing experience to see how powerfully Jung's Red Book has excited the imagination of our invited authors. Each of their essays challenges readers to expand and deepen our thinking about this unique work and does so with the same qualities of individuality and brilliance that we saw in the first two volumes of the series. Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. What creating the Red Book did for Jung is what this work can do for present day readers. Stretch, expand, enliven, and inspire the mind to develop new modes of thinking and perception. It is not just our thoughts, mental contents, that are challenged, but also our way of thinking, mental process. The Red Book, when taken seriously and read deeply, has an enlivening effect. It frees the mind from old habitual tracks and patterns, breaks the spirit free to adventure into new territory, and releases a flow of creativity. The result can be the creation of a new master narrative for the individual and for postmodern culture, something so desperately lacking today as French philosopher and sociologist Jean-Francois Lyotard has convincingly diagnosed as the state of affairs in our age of postmodernity. In this third volume of the series, we encounter 18 new essays that pick up on one or more of the many facets of Jung's groundbreaking work and extend them into greater intelligibility. Each essay is unique, and yet all of them converge on the themes that we as editors outlined at the outset of the project in asking for thoughts about the relevance of the Red Book for our postmodern era. In a letter to the prospective authors, we ask them to consider the following questions. Quote, Can Jung's Red Book help us to navigate meaningfully through the rough waters we find ourselves in today, individually, professionally, politically, and culturally? Consider the spirit of this time today. How can the spirit of the depths be found in a way that is meaningful in our contemporary world? Does the Red Book help us possibly to formulate a new worldview and God image that can sustain people in the present crisis the world finds itself in? Unquote. In the present volume, each of the authors addresses one or more of these pivotal questions. The result, again, is a set of original contributions to our ongoing reflection on the value of the Red Book for our times. The volume opens with an essay by Murray Stein, who proposes that Jung's Red Book is a new link in the Aurea Catenia, the golden chain of imaginative literature, extending from ancient narratives such as the Epic of Gilgamesh to modern and postmodern times. He asks the question, what is the Red Book for analytical psychology? And answers that it is not merely another addition to the shelf of works by C.G. Jung and to the library of thousands of works created by the successive generations of contributors to the field. It is unique in that it is prophetic in the sense of the biblical prophets who speak for the spirit of the deity. This does not confer sacrality upon the Red Book, such as believers have projected upon other sacred writings, but it does challenge the reader to catch a glimpse of the spirit that motivated the creation of the field of analytical psychology and continues to sustain it. 
Paul Bruscia's essay titled The Creative Power of Soul proposes a similar theme and one that is conspicuous in many of the essays, namely that the Red Book demonstrates the creativity of the imagination which is embedded in the unconscious and directed by an agency called soul. This figure is pivotal in the narrative that flows so richly from Jung's imagination as he leaves the spirit of this time and follows the spirit of the depths into the interior spaces of the psyche. Soul challenges Jung's thinking and his feeling from her first appearance in Liber Primus to her last in Scrutinies. She is omnipresent throughout the narrative. Joseph Cambray's essay follows and offers an insightful reflection on Jung's genial use of images for advancing his psychological thinking. Cambray underscores the key insight that for Jung, conceptualization follows imagination, not the other way around. This was based on the conviction that image is psychologically more fundamental than concept or language. The Red Book, as Cambrai convincingly argues, is an example of how this process unfolds in the creation of Jung's later psychological theory. Serbian psychoanalyst Velimir Papovic takes up the theme of the centrality of imagination in Jung's creative work and finds that this pioneering method allowed Jung to break free from the tight constraints that modernity had imposed on theory construction in his time. The use of imagination in the construction of narrative is a key element in postmodern psychology and philosophy, as Popovich shows, and this turn in postmodernity thereby renders Jung's work exceptionally suitable for our times. Popovich finds that Jung uncannily anticipated this postmodern turn of thinking in his Red Book. In the essay that follows Popovich's, his colleague in Belgrade, Serbia, Zanin Princevac de Villablanca, continues this line of thought by looking at the prize-winning documentary film No One's Child as a poignant expression of loss of soul in postmodern times and as a telling representation of the postmodern condition. She brings this into play with a reflection on similar motifs in Jung's Red Book. Lebanese scholar Samir Mahmoud in turn also highlights the role of imagination in the Red Book and finds that this provides a way for religious Muslims to read Jung with interest and respect. His discussion of the rejection of secular depth psychology, which has no space for transcendence by the advocates of religious psychology, which is guided by the notion of transcendence and the existence of transcendent beings, is concise and instructive. The Red Book offers the devout Muslim an entry into Jung's thought, he argues, because it relies on what Henry Corbin discusses as the role of imagination in the works of the great mystic of Islam, Ibn Arabi. Jung's similar understanding of imagination opens a space for appreciative consideration of the possibilities of transcendent interventions in postmodern human consciousness. In the next chapter, Japanese psychoanalyst Toshio Kawai brings his refined Japanese sensibility into play as he reflects on the Red Book as a chapter in Jung's personal individuation process on the possibilities of Jung's display of imagination to dismantle that barriers between consciously scripted narratives and the more open and generously endowed perspectives of the unconscious that are not limited by the restriction of one's culture. Kawai's astonishment at Jung's achievement in navigating the influx of imagery that came to him during his journey through the depths of the inner world is described with a deep feeling of appreciation and respect. 
considering two types of administration in the essay that follows, Mexican Jungian psychoanalyst Patricia Michan takes up the distinction made by Jung between false and true imagination and reworks this dichotomy in a thoughtful essay on the usefulness of both types in clinical psychology. Having worked extensively with Mesoamerican and particularly Mexican mythologies, Michan has a finely honed sensitivity to the creative possibilities of imagery that looks at first glance to be merely pathological and worthless. She teaches us to look for the golden seed in the dross and offers graphic examples from her practice as a Jungian psychoanalyst. Swedish Jungian psychoanalyst Gunilla Midbo picks up on a similar theme and develops the issue of shadow integration in the Red Book and in Norse mythology, using as a backdrop her own childhood experiences in Norway and Sweden. The Japanese Jungian psychoanalyst Mari Yoshikawa then looks at the image of the serpent in the Red Book and traces its presence throughout the entire text. The issue of integration of shadow and instinct lie at the base of both essays and constitute a common theme. One of the remarkable outcomes of these many culturally diverse reflections on Jung's Red Book in our series is that the themes Jung presents and takes up in that work are universal and apply to ancient traditions and to postmodern cultures to an equal degree. This is one of the most significant features of Jung's genius, namely that by following the spirit of the depths, he reaches a level of the collective unconscious that is multi-specific. Linda Carter's essay, which follows upon Yoshikawa's, views Jung's meticulous care in the constructing his Red Book as the work of an artist craftsman. She makes the important distinction between craft and art and reflects on how the hand of the craftsman in Jung offered his imagination the opportunity to reveal its contents and to fix them in time and space. She speaks of craftsmanship as knowing with one's hands and compares it to the work of alchemists in their laboratories. Irish scholar Matthew Mather then continues the reflections on the alchemical nature of the Red Book and focuses his comments on the theme of conjunctio, the union of opposites, a motif that would become central in Jung's later work on the psychology of the transference. Transformation through imagination that flows through the hands is a common feature of Carter's and Mather's essays. Japanese Jungian psychoanalyst Megumi Yama leads us then to the theme of the dead in the Red Book and compares Jung's confrontation with the spirits of the dead with kami spirits in Japanese Shinto religion. Following upon Yama's touching portrayal of Japanese religion and culture, the notion of invisible spirits inhabiting the material world and having distinct effects on the lives of humans is taken up in a creative way by Anna Malishevich in her remarkable exploration of the presence of the trickster in the postmodern business world, especially in startup enterprises. The presence of the unconscious and its energies is not limited to religious rite and ritual, but is equally manifest in the most secular of all domains, the world of business. The Red Book argues the same in its insistence that the spirit of the depths underlies and influences the spirit of the times, whatever it might be or wherever it might go. The famous psychiatric case of Daniel Paul Schreiber catches the perspicacious eye of Chicago-based George Hoganson. Jung's appreciation of Schreiber's delusions and fantasies as prophetic and as having perspective value and indeed spiritual significance for Schreiber, as he claimed in court when he argued for his release from the asylum, follows from Jung's understanding of the creative nature of the unconscious and its forward-looking perspective. 
This induced Jung to revalue the works of the imagination and to see the imagination as a primary creative agency within the psyche. Paradoxically, Schreber was a forerunner of the experimental work that Jung engaged in when undertaking his form of active imagination and creating the material that would go into his Red Book. French Jungian scholar Christine Maillard and German Jungian psychoanalyst Ingrid Rydell, both university professors in religious studies with many years of academic experience and numerous publications in their native and French to their credit, Take a look at Jung's revisioning of the Christian doctrine of Christ and the Christian tradition. Maillard analyzes Jung's Christology and his proposals for how to integrate this religious symbol into modern and postmodern consciousness, while Rydell focuses on Jung's projection of a new God image and his pioneering efforts to create a new psychology of religion. Both essays regard the Red Book as a major contribution to the future of religious life and thought in the present and future. Concluding this volume, the well-known American Jungian scholar and international lecturer and teacher, Stephen Eisenstadt, recommends reading the Red Book meditatively as a dream. In his autobiographical essay, The Quest for One's Own Red Book in the Digital Age, he offers a moving personal testimony to the power of imagination to open up inner space as he honors the extraordinary capacity of Jung's Red Book to guide us through psychic worlds that are largely inaccessible to the rational mind and therefore unknown and possibly frightening. While reminding us of the dangers of being sucked up totally into the cyberspace of the digital age, Eisenstadt ingeniously considers ways of using its technologies for enlarging and vivifying inner space, thus transforming this threat to a means for psychic enrichment. For this purpose, he finds the Red Book to be a precious resource for facing the unsettling, unique challenges of these postmodern times with courage and creativity. In summary, the essays in this third volume of the series on Jung's Red Book's relevance for our postmodern time again offer many angles of vision and point to a variety of directions for further reflection on this remarkable work that we are beginning to recognize as a new link in the Aurea Catenia extending far back into ancient times and suggesting new possibilities for meaning in the present and future. I've been reading from the introduction to Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, Volume 3. Japanese Jungian psychoanalyst Megumi Yama leads us then. I'm sorry. When when you see me get emotional like this, and this will be cut out of the final video, so this is only for those of you who are interested in the behind the scenes aspect of my process here. Um, when um, I'm reading about these places and people from places like Japan where I lived for eight years and uh, places like um, Lebanon uh, and Muslim countries where I have spent a great deal of time 
have been in 12 Muslim countries, um, they have um, what we would call um, neurolinguistic programming hooks or um, anchors to a lot of my life's history. And so often a lot of these things come back up on me as I'm reading. And I apologize for that. Okay, I'm on page nine. I'm reading from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. Murray Stein and Thomas Arst as editors. This is volume three, which has just been published in the last couple of weeks. And to the theme of the dead in the Red Book. French Jungian scholar Christine Maillard I just point out that it's uh, it's Ingrid Rydell's essay which I read yesterday but I'm going to have to reread so that it's we have a, a listenable <laughs> video and so I'll do that again probably tomorrow <clears throat> Sean says, do you think this is true? Anything in this world that you believe is good and valuable and worth striving for can hurt you. Yes, I surely do believe that that's true. So we always have to consider the consequences of what we are doing. And I think that karma is real. In my experience in life, I can assure you that karma is quite real. And as a matter of fact, it's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Maybe I can give it to you here just for, just for grins. Okay, so I'm reading from the Jerusalem Bible, uh, Reader's Edition, chapter 22 of Revelation, chapter 22. 10. This too he said to me, do not keep the prophecies in this book a secret because the time is close. Meanwhile, let the sinner go on sinning and the unclean continue to be unclean. Let those who do good go on doing good and those who are holy continue to be holy. Very soon now I shall be with you and again bringing the reward to be given to every man according to what he deserves. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Happy are those who will have washed their robes clean, so that they will have the right to feed on the tree of life and can come through the gates into the city. These others must stay outside dogs, fortune tellers, and fornicators, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone of false speech and false life. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to make these revelations to you for the sake of the churches. I am of David's line, the root of David, and the bright star of the morning. The Spirit and the Bible say, Come, let everyone who listens answer. Come, then let all who are thirsty come, all who want it may have the water of life, and have it free. This is my solemn warning to all who hear the prophecies of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him every plague mentioned in the book. If anyone cuts anything out of the prophecies of this book, God will cut off his share of the tree of life and of the holy city which are described in the book. The one who guarantees these revelations repeats his promise, I shall indeed be with you soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. And that ends the Holy Bible. And so the important part of it here is very soon now I shall be with you again, bringing the reward to be given to every man according to what he deserves. And so the sad part of it 
is that you can't always know the consequences of your actions and how you'll be paid back later. But I've seen enough examples in my own life to know that those who I have felt have wronged me have paid for that very dearly without me ever having to seek vengeance in any way. And so I always strive for the good, but Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes the things you do are not good, can't be predicted. And so uh, you have to make the best judgment you can at any given moment. And if you discover you've made a mistake, you try to correct it if you can.